Welcome everyone to uh, this memorial service for, uh, for Grandpa. Um, all of the friends and family who were able to attend. Uh, we're going to start off with a prayer from Bill's son, Mark. Sergeant uh, Navarro and Sergeant Kurlutska are here to honor Grandpa. My fellow soldier and I are here to render final military honors to a fallen comrade. Today's honors will consist of the playing of taps, the unfolding, refolding, and presentation of the flag. In a moment, I will ask all who are physically able to please stand during the playing of taps. Current and former military members may render the proper hand salute. All of us can place their hand over the heart. At the conclusion of taps, please be reseated for the folding and presentation of the flag. Please stand.
behalf of President of the United States, the United States Army, and a great friend. Please accept this flag as a symbol of our appreciation for your love and honor and faithful service. Thank you to Sergeant McDonald and Sergeant Orozco uh, for that. We're grateful for Grandpa and his service and his example to us over the years, and to all of you who have served in the military as well. Uh, at this point in time, uh, Amy, uh, one of the granddaughters, is going to, to share a few thoughts about Grandpa. I could be. 
I know he's done the same for many people in this room. What an incredible legacy to leave behind, to inspire people by example. Grandpa was a man of action. Anyone that traveled to or with him knows this. If you were going to leave at Let's say 10 a.m. the next day, he'd be up at 6 asking if you were getting it on the road. <laughs> he was always looking for that next activity. And the man loved to worry. He, he looked for, he loved to have that worry stone. I think it kept him busy, his mind busy. But he didn't use it as a barrier, he used it to make his life better. And, uh, and he did that his whole life provided for his family, even when times were tough. You know, Grandpa lived to his late 90s, of course, and do you know he was still financially independent? And that's really impressive. Grandpa, he wasn't a rich man. He didn't have a fancy career or, or, a, or a ton of money to work with, but in fact, he started over again multiple times financially in his life. But uh, he still found a way to set aside enough money so that he could take care of he and Grandma. And I think that that's, that's impressive. That's something to really be admired. But of course, Grandpa's greatest riches were his love and his family and his love of the gospel. I'm so inspired by the love that Grandma and Grandpa shared. 76 years of marriage. It's incredible and the spirit in which they loved one another is so special. They stood side by side, loving each other every day. They weathered a lot of storms, but they did it together. And their love, it grew stronger and deeper over the years. I saw that firsthand. It gave us a beautiful example of what true love and dedication can look like. We all should aspire to have that in our lives. I was just here last weekend for Megan's wedding, and Grandma attended with me. We got to go together, and they must have kissed one another three or four times before we would leave, even though Grandpa was in so much pain and really having a hard time. He didn't want to miss the wedding, but he couldn't miss that kiss. And we came back equally as much. <laughs> They loved each other, and love has always been unbreakable. And Grandma, I'm so happy we're a forever family. You had 76 years on earth together, and now you get to look forward to an eternity together in heaven. I know he's here with us today, and I know, he, I know we'll get to see him again someday. It's one of the wonderful things about having the gospel in our lives. We have the knowledge that we get that there is life after death and that through the atonement we have the opportunity to be together again someday. I'm so thankful that Grandma and Grandpa decided to join the church and make that an important part of our family. Grandpa had a strong testimony. <laughs> Uh, you know, I felt that influence in my life and his encouragement and the strength that God provided me to live my life in accordance with the gospel. I'm eternally thankful for the influence of this wonderful man. You know, I miss him so much. You know, making me laugh. He's giving me a hard time. He's be so happy to see me when I come to visit. May he lived a beautiful and rich life, filled with so many adventures, so, so much love. And I hope to honor his legacy by living my life in a similar way. Thank you. Uh, we're going to have uh, Kent and Barbara uh, Christensen come up. Uh, they
they have treated grandpa as their own and taken such good care of him. We're going to try. We're going to share what thoughts they, they can. You know, they came back into our life at a little point.
there's a lot of stories we probably could tell. Some of them I, I've been told weren't true by Uncle Bill, but I'm still not sure. <laughs> um, probably one of the, the best ones I can think of is my, I think my dad told me that when they were little, Bill's always been fascinated with planes. And as a, supposedly as a child, I don't know, 8, 10, 12, he built a, an airplane out of boxes or whatever and got up on the roof <laughs> to, to fly down the roof. Now he tells me that that's not true, but I don't know. That's, it was made, made for a good story. So, But they were always, they, as a child, we didn't see a lot of them. Even though they lived half a mile down the road, we never really had a lot to do with it. When my dad needed some special equipment like the welder or whatnot, we'd go down to their ranch, their dairy, and do stuff. But they were the rich <laughs> side of the family because they had the airplane and they were gone all the time. And so we didn't know them, but I'm glad that we got to come to know them as they filled in for our family that was still over here. So. I just, I got to know them a lot when they moved into Parker Set. I saw them every Sunday and then I got from every Sunday to almost every day to every day. Um, some of our caregivers are here, just one of you now. Um, couldn't have done it without you. And you guys know that I tell you that all the time. They're awesome. When he got sick and was put into hospice um, for four days, every day I hugged him. I want you to know he knows that all of you loved him. Every day I hugged him a number of times and said, this is from Lindsay. She said to give you a hug and a kiss, even though I hadn't talked to you, you know, still, you know. And whenever any of you would call and say, give him a hug and a kiss. So he had has hug and kisses from every one of you in the last two weeks, okay? And just know that he knows that you guys loved him. Okay, um, can't say enough about the caregivers, and I'm not saying that just because my favorite one is sitting in here. <laughs> but, um, awesome. Whenever you needed anything, they were there. When we started him in hospice, they were there all the time. They truly love them. I have, and none of you guys will have to worry about her being taken care of because they love your mom. And so I just wanted to thank them publicly with you guys because they, they are awesome. And just to let you know, he did, he, it was very peaceful when he went. And um, the pain was in control. He just fell asleep <coughs> after we both told him it was time to go. And he just closed his eyes and went to sleep very peacefully. We were on the phone talking to Jan, I think it was. Yeah, and he had gone after we, five minutes without, you know, because she kept going, what's he waiting for? Because they had told us at hospice that day that it was going to be that day. It would be within hours. And she kept wondering what he was waiting for. And when she went and told him that, then it was just like what he needed. So I just thank you guys for what you meant for him, meant to him, all of you. And um, just know that he loved you guys all very much.
and the hospice nurse came, and she was doing the evaluation on him and, and telling us a lot of things. We were we brought the hospital bed in for him that day and whatnot. And she's getting ready to leave, and she tells him, um, "I'll see you tomorrow." And he says, "No, you won't." And she goes, "Well, why?" Why am I not going to see you tomorrow? And he says, I'm not going to be here. And she says, well, where are you going? He says, we're going to the ball game. <laughs> and she goes, who's playing? Or who are you going to go see? And she said, he goes, who's playing? <laughs> so he had his sense of humor up until the very end. Uh, well, I'm, I'm Lindsay. I'm Bill's granddaughter from Don, uh, youngest. And we decided that since Grandpa was such a had such an infectious, fun personality, we needed to sing a fun song. So we're going to do a medley of Somewhere Over the Rainbow and uh, What a Wonderful World. So here we go. Ready? Okay.
Thank you, Jerry, Lindsay, and Audrey. That was a beautiful music. Uh, now we will have the eulogy by Grandpa's son, Don. I'm not exactly positive what a eulogy is, so I asked my mom. <laughs> my mom said that it was a tribute of praise, basically. And Giving my dad a tribute of praise is a real easy thing to do. 1920 was a great year because my dad was born in 1920. 1941 wasn't the greatest year, as we all know, especially December of that year. But that was the same year that my father and my mother got married. And that was a union that will live on forever. And all of us in this room <clears throat> are blessed because of that union. All of us who have had the opportunity to, to know Bill um, are blessed. One of my granddaughters, one of Lindsay's daughters, was recently chastised by her schoolmates because she called her father daddy. And they thought that was kind of silly, so she, she leaned over to, to her mother and said, is it okay if I call him daddy? She said, well, your grandfather is 65 years old and he still calls his dad daddy. And I always will, because he's my daddy. And I believe that my brothers call him that as well. My mother was a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints all of her life. But when she got married to this great man, she decided that she would allow her membership in the church to just kind of take a back seat to a man that she loved very much. And they got married and they continued their lives together for 20 years, nearly 20 years. Um, my father loved airplanes and from my age of five, we had a plane, and we had a, a, a runway right on the land. And uh, my father was involved in the Flying Farmers Association, and he was very anxious for my mother to be the queen of that organization. In 1969, I think it was, or was it? No, 59, yes. And so he convinced her that she should do that, but. My mom said, well, I'll tell you what, I will, I will run to be the queen if, when my year as queen is over, you will investigate the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. He agreed to that because he wanted her to be the queen. <laughs> and she was the queen and has been the queen of our home ever since then. But after that year completed, my father investigated the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I was nine years old at the time. We took the lessons and we gained a testimony of the truthfulness of the church. We gained a testimony of the life of Jesus Christ and the importance that Jesus Christ has for all of us on this earth. And we all joined the church in 1961, December of 1961. I just want to just want to let you know some of the things that my father believes and knows to be true. He was anxious to pass to pass on. He was in pain. He his life wasn't as as wonderful as it could have been since he had lost his sight. He loved his family, but he was ready to go. But I want you to know why. Because he knew that he wasn't really going to die. All he was going to do was experience the separation of his spirit from his physical body. His physical body would remain just like a glove that he used to take off and throw on the ground as he was finished with his work for the day. But his spirit would live on, and it does live on. In my personal opinion, he is here with us now feeling the love that each of you have for him and feeling the love that his mother, that his wife and my mother have for him. And 
another, I was telling mother and I was telling everybody in the family, as we were driving here from Utah, I was imagining my dad passing through that veil of forgetfulness that separates us from the spirits that are, that are the other children of our Heavenly Father. And I saw my dad go in and greet his mother and his father and his grandparents and all of the relatives that had predeceased him. And after he got done with that, I'm guessing that he started looking for people like Albert Einstein <laughs> or Amelia Earhart or the guy who designed the P-51. I, I truly believe that. He probably looked up Mr. Bowie <laughs> and, and all of those people. I can certainly imagine that he tried to find Jimmy Stewart <laughs> because they had so much in common, both of them being pilots of, of B-17s in the war. I know that my father knows that Jesus Christ lives. He knows that his heavenly father lives. And I am comforted to know that he is with them now. And I am comforted to know that someday all of us will be as well. My father was a great teacher. He, he was a great teacher because he taught by example. I remember, But I was the youngest boy in the family, and by the time I got to the point where I could do the chores, my dad realized this guy isn't going to do much for me. <laughs> <laughs> He'd already worn out Jerry and Marvin, <laughs> and, uh, and so he just let me go off and, and play and, and do my thing. I, uh, I had a lot of interests, and he didn't stand in the way of those interests. But the great thing about his teaching ability was that he didn't Teach. He didn't dictate what to do. He taught by example. And the one thing that I learned by his example, the several things that I learned, was integrity, hard work. The man had an amazing work ethic. You all know this. I was talking to, to Jerry today about this, and, and uh, there were events where uh, Jerry, Jerry's a young fellow, and he, my dad would come over and help him with the project, and they'd be working through the day, and Jerry was just exhausted. He kept saying, hey, hey, Bill, maybe we ought to just rest. <laughs> no, that wasn't going to happen. He just kept on going, and he did that to the end. He is a great man, and you all know it. And I am very blessed, as are the other members of my family, you have been his son. I will miss him, as all of you will, but he won't be far away from us. Thank you for, for coming, all of you. What does a 40-some-year-old guy have to offer an 85-year-old man <laughs> who's had all this experience, because I, I knew a little bit about Bill, uh, he was um, well versed in you know the scriptures. He, he knew the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what did I really have that could benefit him and his wife? You know they lived out in the country. They 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 loved their family, and um, so I I started I started coming out there, and I, I probably didn't have the best attitude. I thought, well, what do I have to offer this this fellow? Well, when I got out there the very first time, I noticed man, they had all kinds of cobwebs. Around their, the, 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 right around the front door and, and whatnot. So uh, I, I give my message and I ask Bill, Bill, is there any service I can do for you? Like maybe I can brush down the cobwebs. And he goes, well, why would you want to do that? Those catch the flies and keep the flies from the <laughs> 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 Hey, I'm Going and uh, I noticed that they had a you know nice picket fence out in front of their house. Well, it was starting to you know the paint was starting to crumble off it. So I worked up the, the nerve another time to ask Bill. Well, Bill, is there anything I can do for you? He said, oh, Of course, you know Bill. No, I don't need anything. I said, well, how about we? I get some of the young boys together at the church and we come out and we we re whitewash your picket fence. 
Well, what do you want to do that for? It, it, still, it still looks good to me. Well, then I found out that Bill was partially blind. <laughs> he would never let me do anything for him. And it was mentioned earlier about his garden. And um, Janet and I, because uh, I would go with Bill to home teach Janet, we were the beneficiaries of that wonderful corn. Well, one summer, not that many years ago, when they were still living out on Fox Road, uh, he didn't have any corn. And I asked, you know, Bill, no corn this year? You didn't plant a garden? He, he kind of got embarrassed because he had planted corn, but when he went out to spray the weeds, because of his eyesight not being very well, he sprayed the corn instead. But he had a great crop of weeds, but there was <laughs> I was, I was uh, called to be Bill's bishop. <coughs> and, uh, we had a, and that's when he celebrated his 70th wedding anniversary. So we had a, a group of individuals that went out to his home, and I thought, wow, 70 years married to the same person. What a, what a saint Pauline was. <laughs> <laughs> but, and then, as time went on, all of a sudden it was time to celebrate his 75th wedding anniversary. And um, they were now living here in Park Merced, and they had a, a big shindig for him here. And, and Bill was, uh, he was quite proud because they had a, a great big banner made for him with some of his, um, it was actually a copy of his family portrait that I, I believe uh, Doc uh, painted for him here. And he, he was so proud of that thing, and, and he was um, so thankful that he could spend 75 years married to this, this wonderful um, lady that he had found back when she was 16. <laughs> he was kind of a, a cradle rocker. <laughs> he first told me that story. Now, all you family members, I, I got to go 12 years with Bill, and you know, he just didn't want me to come in and say my message and leave, he wanted, he wanted to talk and chat. And then uh, later on, we were assigned to be partners to come and visit uh, Janet Ingram. And so we went for, we've been going for five or six or seven, I don't even know how long it's been together, over there to, to visit her. And he would tell me all kinds of stories about his family. So I know all the good stuff. <laughs> about, about, about a lot of you. But a couple of wonderful stories about Bill. Uh, well, they're still living out on the farm. I went to visit him one month, and, and he had, I can't recall right now what he had, maybe he had a broken arm or a broken wrist, or he had a bandage on his head or something, and I asked him, Bill, well, what happened? Well, he was out pruning one of his fruit trees, and he, he fell off the ladder. And he was quite embarrassed, because he was quite the, quite the rancher and farmer. And it wasn't long after that, a couple more months went by, and I went out to visit again, and he had another alley or something going on. I said, well, Bill, what happened? I, I fell out of the apricot tree. Of course, when Pauline had gotten after him the first time he fell off the ladder, because here's a, a man who probably was in his 90s then, and she was scolding him that he didn't need to be up on a ladder pruning the trees, and she made him promise that he wouldn't get on the ladder to prune the trees anymore. Well, he fell out of the tree because he wasn't on the ladder, he just climbed up in the tree to prune. Well, then she made him promise not to prune the trees anymore, because she figured he'd probably find a way to get up on the roof to then, to then prune the tree. I don't totally not remember that or not, but... Um, it wasn't too long ago, uh, we were driving over to Janet's house, and Bill was really excited. And I asked him what he was so excited about. And he proceeded to tell me about the birthday present that his family had put together for him. And they took him uh, flying. Now, he, had, he had long since stopped flying and had sold off all his planes, but um, I don't know which family member was responsible for it, but they put together a chance where he got to go in a plane and 
fly up on his birthday, or for his birthday, and the, the pilot of the plane actually let him fly the plane for a little bit. And he, he just reminded me, here he was in his 90s, just of a, a little boy in, in a candy store. He was so excited that he got to do something that he had a tremendous passion for. And all our years together, he had told me numerous you know, stories of, of his adventures flying in World War II. And then when he uh, owned his own airplanes and, and he relayed the story about uh, you know, Pauline uh, winning her title as queen and flying and, and uh, how he had been to listen to the uh, missionaries and, and join the church. And maybe that's how Bill and I kind of hit it off. We had something in common. Well, both of us had married a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Neither one of us were members. And uh, it took me roughly 10 years of being married to uh, a member before I joined the church. Well, Bill, the first time I told him that, he was like, ah, I got that beat. I waited 20 years before I joined. And then, then we also had something in common where we both mentioned to each other, uh, if we had a regret in life, it was that we didn't join the church sooner so that our family could benefit from having that gospel love and the priesthood to bless our, our, our families in, our, in, in that home and not have to rely on you know, somebody else coming and, and doing some sacred ordinances for us. You know, Bill always had uh, a worry that um, he would pass away before Pauline. And, and it, it bothered him quite a bit. And I think many of you know that it, he took that so much to heart you know, because Pauline had um, some physical challenges many, many years in, in their, a year ago in their marriage and uh, had some memory issues. And I can't remember what the condition was. But, you know, I heard that story. Well, Bill wanted to be around to take care of her. So he ate extremely healthy. And he would, he would tell me about how he was eating raw fish and raw vegetables. And he, he subscribed to this magazine about how sugar was just, you know, the worst poison on the earth. And, and every time I come over there, they'd have, you know, that month's issue of that little pamphlet. He'd give it to me to, and, to unless, read. And, and, unless it was in chocolate. <laughs> well, I had a feeling that he was probably, you know, saying one thing. You know, <laughs> But I just was impressed that he, he cared so deeply for his eternal companion that he didn't want her to, uh, to be alone. He was always worried that she was going to be well taken care of. And, um, I think the last year or so, when we drive out to, to Janice's home, to, uh, just on the side of Atwater, um, you know, Bill was at peace with if he did happen to pass away before, before his dear wife because he felt that she was comfortable here. She had lots of friends here. In fact, Bill called her, she was like a social butterfly. Um, you know, they would leave to go to lunch or to, to dinner, and you know, he would get frustrated because he'd want to get right back to the apartment, and Pauline would want to go along and, and talk to, to her friends. So he was at peace that she was going to be well taken care of here. And, and um, it was mentioned earlier that and she will be uh, well taken care of here. I do remember a time when, uh, I don't think Pauline was with us, but we went to home teach Janet and we had given our message and we were about ready to say goodbye. And, um, you know, Bill, he was a kisser. Bill liked to kiss. And as we were saying goodbye to Janet, and he always gave her a hug. And, and uh, well, maybe Pauline was there because I think Pauline kissed Janet. And, she always did that. And about that time, Bill got up there to get his hug, and I think maybe he went to give, give her a kiss on the cheek. Well, Janet turned and he kissed her right on the lips. And of course, I ate um, I think Janet made a comment like, uh, well, Bill, aren't you embarrassed? Your wife's right here. And he, he kind of gave her a little sly wink. Like he, like he meant to do it, right? I knew he did. But um, Bill, loved, Bill loved to serve. 
and, we, and we've heard many stories about that. And when he, he got older, you know, he couldn't drive, but he was worried about how he could still fulfill his duty to go home teach. And um, I told him, well, Bill, I'll, I'll drive you. We'll go together. And so I kind of became his junior companion. I, I told him, I'll be your wingman. So we would, we would go every month to Janice pretty faithfully. And if it got later in the month, uh, first he was in charge of calling her and, and whatnot. And then he got to the point where he couldn't remember sometimes whether, I think Jane couldn't remember whether we'd been there. And he called, he'd get frustrated. So then I told him, well, Bill, instead of you giving the lesson, I'll give the lesson and I'll make contact with her and, and you can say the prayer. Because before he would give the lesson and I would, I would say the prayer. And um, he, 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 he appreciated the fact that we, we could do that every week. And sometimes, uh, or not every week, but every month. And sometimes we got later in the month, he, he, he'd get panicky. Some of you have mentioned that you like to worry. Well, he, he'd call me up on the phone and he'd talk, well, we haven't gone and seen her yet, so when are we going to go? And I said, well, Bill, yeah, she's, she's got the schedule where we're trying to work it out. But he would, he would keep on me to, to go. And, and it got to be difficult in the end to, to go visit her. And he was, always, he was looking for a way out, I think. He would tell me, I can't do this anymore. And um, when we drive out there, he was trying to build a case why we couldn't, he couldn't go anymore just too old and it was too difficult and his body was given an ailment. But after we were there and visited with Janet, on the way home, he always like asked for forgiveness that he had such an idea not to want to go do that. That he enjoyed going to, to visit her. In fact, he loved it. I think he, um, Janet, you probably became the daughter that he wasn't able to raise here on this earth. He, he loved going to visit you. He was bold sometimes in his lessons when we would go out to visit you in some of the things that, in some of the messages that he did deliver. But, but uh, what a wonderful man. He, he loved his, he loved his uh, family. He loved his country. I don't think there was a prayer that he offered that he didn't invoke, you know, God's help in keeping this country free and us to have the liberties and, and freedoms that we enjoy. I think he did that just about every month. Loved his family, loved his country. He loved to fly. And there's a, there's a church leader that is a that was a pilot in, in the German Air Force and uh, flew for a German airline. And Bill loved it when I would use that man's message of course, Bill claimed that he couldn't read, but he always knew the lesson. Because if I had skipped something, he'd remind me that I skipped something on the way home. But, but he, he loved his, his family. He loved his country. He loved flying, like we've heard. And, uh, and he, he, loved, he loved the church. He loved to serve. He loved the gospel of Jesus Christ. And um, he would pray. He would, he would invoke um, God's blessing and the angel's protection upon the Ingram household every month. And uh, he, he really impressed me. Uh, he, he became my adopted grandfather. And my grandfather passed away many, many years ago when I was in high school. And um, he became my adopted grandfather. And I, and I, I loved going to home teach with him. He was a wonderful man, which, of course, we all know that. That's why we're all here. Um, I would like to, to share my belief with you, and it's very similar to what, in fact, it's exactly similar to what Bill believed. We believe that we all are children of a loving Heavenly Father, that we have a Savior in Jesus Christ who atoned for our sins, for our sorrows, for anything that uh, troubles us. He came to this earth and fulfilled a mission that we all have agreed upon when we lived together before we all came to this earth. And he had a firm testimony of that, a firm belief. I don't 
don't think you can shake that uh, off of him. Um, he loved his wife immensely, and I witnessed that. Um, I witnessed that one time I went out to offer him a blessing because he hadn't been feeling well, and he was laying in bed. It was, it was in the evening, and he was about ready to go to bed. And so I, I, I ministered to him, gave him a blessing, a priesthood blessing, and he was ready to go to sleep. And Pauline put some eye drops in his eye and then kissed him goodnight. And um, I think that uh, that's one thing that he missed when he had to move here was the fact that his dear wife could take care of him, put those eye drops in his eye, and she would be the last thing that he, he would see every night before he went to bed. And, I, and he shared that with me one time we were driving out to Janet's that you know, now when they came here, the, the, the staff put the eye drops in his eyes and he had to keep his eyes closed for a period of time in, in order to fall asleep. But he, he really missed that Pauline you know, with us that time. Uh, that was something that was very dear to him. And, um, just, and, and they were always smooching around here too. <laughs> when, when we'd go to leave, sometimes Pauline would go with us and sometimes she wouldn't. But, she didn't go, she always saw us off, and she gave him a kiss goodbye. So I, I know that Bill had a immense, an intense passion and desire and, and, and a love for his wife. And um, thankfully, we all know that you're an eternal couple, and that love will carry on forever. Um, Bill had a testimony of the Book of Mormon. Um, a lot of times in my lesson, lesson of this um, experience that uh, a person from church would have, and, and on the way back home, Bill would share a scripture that tied into that lesson, in his way of kind of teaching me that I didn't quite give, give the lesson. <laughs> and Bill had a testimony that the gospel had been restored on the earth, back to the original version that Christ set up when he was on the earth. I know those things to be true, and I know Bill knew them to be true. And um, I'm going to miss him. I'm going to have to get a new com new companion, <laughs> Janet. I'll have to we'll have to work something out so we can still come and, and visit you. But I just want you to know that Bill did love going out there. And he, 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 he loved you as just as a daughter. And I leave that testimony with you, my friends, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.